Welcome back to Brighter Morning with Bo. I am Bo Tiwari and we're glad to have you here. Our telephone numbers are 609-6283. You're free to call and make a comment or ask a question. 609-6284. 609-6283, 609-6284. guests in this half of the show is going to be the Minister of Trade and Industry, Ms. Paula uh, Gopi Schoon, and we will be with her shortly. Before we go to her, though, I want to make a comment on, you know, we were talking about to Ms. Kalu just a minute ago, and we're talking about uh, reputation and intangible assets, etc. This thing with Nicki Minaj, is a clear example of how someone can use uh, their brand or their reputation, uh, which are intangible assets, and their following, which comes because of that intangible assets, uh, irresponsibly and in a very negative way, in a way that causes havoc that you did not even uh, realize could happen. And here it is, you have a situation where we are trying to vaccinate people, as many people as possible, to deal with the challenge in Trinidad and Tobago. And what she did cause, puts a damper on that. And the second thing that happens is that uh, she basically gets into the controversy of to vaccinate or not to vaccinate, and that affects the whole world because of her reputation and the the rate at which news travels on this particular issue. Um, and so this business of intangible assets is something to understand. You can see the power of it, and the power can be either positive or negative. Uh, but we go on now to a caller on the line. We have a caller on the line very quickly. Yes, good morning. Did we lose our caller? Hi, good morning, Dr. Juari. Morning. Um, I looked on at that uh, last in interview with Ms. Kalu. Yeah. And I must say it was very interesting, very eye-opening. It appears to me that intellectual property and all that goes with it, as she indicated, is definitely one of the ways that our country can walk the walk when it comes to diversification, this diversification conversation that we've been having ad infinitum. You, um, I think uh, Minister Paula Gopi Schoon is up next on yes. your show. Yes. So I want to humbly suggest that maybe you can use uh, a couple minutes of that interview to discuss with her the ministries and the government's intentions going forward regarding diversification, especially as it relates to inter intellectual property. Well, Let's I'm, get a perspective from her. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that will be part of the conversation. Uh, I'm sure, and I'm sure, I'm sure that even if I don't ask the question, that the minister would volunteer a, a contribution on that area because it's so much on the minds of people. Okay, but thank you very much for your contribution. I'm grateful. All right, very well then. Um, so we, uh, I, I was talking about this business of intangible assets in the case of Nicki Minaj and how um, complex the impact can be, not only in a positive way, but in a negative way as well. Um, the other issue that we have as a raging controversy in Trinidad and Tobago is the issue of the commissioner of police and the appointment or reappointment and the appointment process of the commissioner of police. This thing has been raging for some time. We are uncertain. The matter has even gone to court. Um, and um, there are reports in the papers to which the commissioner uh, 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 refers. I want to state very clearly that I did ask the Commissioner of Police to appear on this program on two occasions, and uh, I thought that he might have taken the opportunity to appear, but he declined. Um, 
So uh, we don't have the benefit of that, but it would have been great for him to come here and express his point of view and answer some questions because uh, I would have probed some of the issues. Um, so th that, is, that is, is an issue that will continue for some time until it's resolved because nobody knows really for sure what will happen. We do understand the process, which is that the Police Service Commission uh, makes a list and recommends uh, the Police Service Commission sends that list to the... I'm not questioning the process, I'm just explaining it. Um, the, I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, that is the system we have. So that goes to Her Excellency the President. Her Excellency then, the President then sends that to the Prime Minister uh, with a list in term in, in, in in terms of the ranking of the people for consideration, uh, the Prime Minister is um, then has the opportunity through the executive to bring the matter to Parliament. Uh, the Prime Minister is not bound by the um, by the list um, or the ranking in the list and the Prime Minister uh, can determine whom the government wants to support in the Parliament and by simple majority uh, so that means in spite of whatever protests might be made by the opposition or differences of opinion, the government can then get the commissioner that it wants. So we will see how that plays out. That is the constitutional position at the present time. And we will see how that particular situation plays out. I want to indicate that I do have the Minister of National Security as one of my guests on Monday morning so we will have a conversation with him and find out what is happening in national security. Originally, we had talked about uh, his appearing on the program as we are having many of these ministers and having people from the business community and economists from the various institutions to talk uh, in a pre-budget framework, but it is inevitable that this matter is going to come up in my conversation with the Minister of National Security on Monday. And we're glad that he agreed uh, to come. So I want to ask Minister Gopi Schoon, our minister, she's not on the line? What happened? Let's try and get her on, please, now. I think we told her 7.20, it's about 7.20 now. Yeah. All right, uh, so we'll leave that. We'll wait until we get the minister on the line. Thank you for watching, thank you for listening. I'll take calls if you call, 609-6283, 609-6284. And um, I just want to mention some things that are happening uh, outside, that is to say in the world outside. Um, you have the justice for January 6th rally that is taking place tomorrow. Uh, all of Washington is challenged by it. They, nobody knows what is going to happen, whether it's going to be peaceful, whether it's going to be violent. Um, and that is a situation that the United States now face, that the United States now faces, which is that you have a lot of internal, uh, very right-wing based um, issues um, that are focused 
on um, in the current politics, really. So, did we get did we get the link? We got the link. Okay, so we'll try to talk to her uh, immediately rather than keep her waiting. Um, we're trying for a link with the Minister of Trade and Industry. She's on? Let's, good morning. Good morning. Morning. I'm sorry about the delay. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm on Let's, a little earlier than I thought, but that's quite, quite fine. All right. Okay. No, what will happen is that I just want to raise your, lift your volume a little bit so that uh, my let's... Volume, all right. My you okay? volume is quite Right. Fine. Okay. No, I'm, I'm just doing it in the studio so people will hear you better. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Excellent. Good. Well, first of all, Minister, thank you so much for agreeing for, to have this conversation. And we will do it in the context of the upcoming budget. We will not focus on budget issues, but we'll focus on your ministerial issues. And, um, and you may be able to talk about budgetary issues as well. Um, so let me start with the first question, which is that COVID has affected everybody everywhere almost. And it has certainly affected the government. And it has affected government and government service everywhere. How has it affected your ministry? And how have you been able to triumph in a way uh, in spite of it? Good. And I'm glad to be on with you this morning, but we'll just share some of what we're doing in the ministry. But you asked a specific question as to, in the context of the public service, how did the Ministry of Trade and Industry fare? And I have to tell you that we did quite well, I would think, as a unit. Uh, in terms of the staff being able to work remotely. And I'll tell you, I almost think we are an essential service because, as you know, the ports never stopped uh, so that you had goods entering and, and leaving the country. And um, it's, uh, so uh, there were some small breaks. There were some breaks with the, uh, on, the, in, in, on the side of the manufacturing, but notwithstanding, we were required to work from home. Even at the time when we had the bare essentials in operation, and I'm talking about um, the pharmacies and the supermarkets and so on, we would have to be at work to ensure that there was no break. I had to work with my colleagues, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of, um, of, um, of Works and Transport, um, to ensure that we were available to the businesses um, if there were any hiccups at a time when things were really difficult. But coming back to the ministry, we were, there was a time when we all worked remotely, a short period, but as, once we were, we, a few of us were able to come back to work, We've been at work, and um, and then of course we're up to the fifty percent now. Where staff are there, either in some days and out some days, and it's working very well. Even when my, uh, even when the staff of the Ministry of Trade and Industry is when they're at home, staff members they are available. Well, I make sure. They, well, I mean, I'm calling you anyway. And the thing is to show by example the the heads of departments, the PS and so on. They, they have been at work and um, re recalling as well that we don't only serve Trinidad and Tobago because we are manufacturers, we serve the rest of the region primarily and therefore it, the, the import of um, what we do, um, just it, 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 you just have to fulfill and continue doing your work. And uh, I must say they, the staff members did rise to the occasion and um, to ensure that they were available. And this is, I, I think, to a large extent, this may have been across the government as well. I, um, I know that um, customs and so on does not come under your jurisdiction. But, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the complaints of businessmen during the COVID period uh, was really the extreme delays uh, in customs and on the port um, and basically with the importation of goods and so on. Were you able to intervene and try and correct that? And where are we now with that? I'm not asking you. I, as I said, I know that that is not your responsibility. That comes under Ministry of Finance. Absolutely. But it's critical in the trade process um, and the importation process and in right. the, for, for exports as well, you know. Yeah, so, so the port comes under the Ministry of Works and Transport, Customs and Excise under the Minister of Finance. But we do, 
um, we are all integrated. Yeah, and so we, a, we do we do work cohesively, and um, and therefore, if there are issues, they are brought before the ministers. We do talk about these matters, but I cannot say that we had a specific challenge or on any undue challenge at the time of COVID. The port continued, but what I would say is that we do have an issue with uh, with customs and the port in general and i have to admit it because the population the business population speaks to that and um and the evidence is there in that particular category under the doing business report which is trading across borders that there are issues with the time that it takes and the hours the time the hours the cost of, of doing business exporting and importing so we are aware that there are issues and these issues have to be confronted and indeed we have confronted them from many angles and to the extent where I'm sure more recently you would have realized that we are engaging there and there is a um, under Minister West we are engaging um, Newport um, management and this is we have going through at this time the initial process, the expression of interest process, and then we go to the RFP. And the idea is that we must move to the point of efficiency in trading and in movement across borders. That might be just one issue, but it, uh, to the extent, and we talk about the ease of doing business, um, and I was talking about the trading across borders because it, it speaks to imports and exports. But to the extent where we have, and, and it, it, um, it's almost, a bit, uh, to, to almost to the extent where we have done so much in terms of e-services, port services, e-maritime services, e, um, uh, the, port, the port health people, the um, plant quarantine persons are all, all of them, all of them operate electronically already, and there are several e-services associated with movement across the um, uh, um, across uh, in, in terms of trading. And of course, we have moved ahead in terms of um, you can now get a certificate of origin for the export of your goods electronically, and there, and of course, you can do your payments and tra payment transactions to TTBS and to also um, export TT electronically. Yes, we, so that there has been some work, but it has not been enough. And therefore, this is why we went ahead to do, and I'm talking in um, ease of doing business, but it's so ap ap applicable to the question you asked about ports and the efficiency at, 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 and so on. So that there's so much that is being done, but that's, that yet there is so much to be done. And I can go yeah, a little bit further. If you, it's, if, a, it's, if, it's a big challenge, but your ministry has a, a particular challenge now, right? I mean, we have a loss of revenue from the energy sector, mm -hmm. and that is significant. I don't want to go into the details of that, but mm -hmm. what it means is that somebody has to pick up the slack. And how do you generate the revenue? That, in a fundamental way, fo fundamental way falls to you. Um, in part, because part of the solution to that problem is to really reduce the uh, importation cost, uh, which, um, which really is not your domain specifically, but part of it is to increase the exports and to increase the investment and to diversify. How are you, what progress are you making in that area as you, we try to meet this challenge as a country of loss of foreign exchange and loss of revenue from energy? Right, that's not only, that's not a COVID issue per se. That's an no, issue no, that it's we not. It's not at all. It's not a COVID. Yes. And it's an issue that we confronted coming into office in 2015, because as you know, we came out of another crisis then and um, so that we would have met revenue, revenues down from, um, from energy, energy prices from, uh, down in it from 2014, 2015, 2016, so that, and there are several, there have been several um, pockets um, during the last decades, the last two decades, where we would have had to confront issues um, with revenues so that it's it, this is this is not a, a new scenario this is a scenario that speaks to us always 
that we must because of the volatility of, rev of energy prices, which we have depended on, um, we have to therefore seek to diversify. It speaks to diversification and to find ways where we can seek to um, export and earn foreign exchange income to do in import substitution so that we can import less. And of course, it, it, it um, this all dovetails nicely into diversification and of a, a particular agenda with regard to tourism with regard to agriculture, what, with regard to what the are we, and with regard to manufacturing. What are we exporting more, uh, Minister, or what are we, where are we getting new investment from that will lead to increased exports? You All right, to, so you're you talking want to focus on that? Either what, you've, either what you've done or what you anticipate in the coming year. So with regard to exports, and let me go to the figures, and uh, it's important that I do, considering that one would have expected that the export figures would be down given the COVID scenario. And um, I can tell you, uh, we are encouraged in the ministry, and I'm sure it's, it will show itself in terms of the review of the economy or at, the, at the time of the budget in terms of our export figures. Certainly, you would find that for the first half of the year, our export figures would have been down, but they have picked up very nicely, I think, both on the energy side and on the non-energy side, so that our, our FX revenue should be increasing a bit, but certainly our exports have gone up. Um, a, due in part for the increase in energy prices, but also on the part of the manufacturing. Um, of course, there were um, uh, there are all sorts of scenarios on account of COVID. And indeed, looking at our non-energy exports in particular, the figures we had gone down to as low as 350 or just above into the million dollars in terms of our export figures, which is a sharp reduction. Uh, from the an average, I would see of um, in the last in the last few years of seven hundred and fifty million, and this is non energy of an average of seven hundred and fifty million TT per month. I'm telling you, in the last few months, it's so encouraging. We've gone up to uh, in excess of a million, so we're heading in the right direction. So despite COVID. Um, we are heading in the right direction, but I'll tell you where the nuance is. Of course, um, you know the trying times that we all are having, and in particular the region, and our, the region is our, a particularly important um, export market. And um, so that we have lost some of that because they don't have their tourism population that they would normally have, which would be increase the demand for our food and beverage exports and so on. We don't have that, but yet still the figures are going up. So we've gone in there to understand what's happening. And I can tell you that we have exports going now to some new markets, but there are particular goods that are doing well. I can tell you that the INO has picked up exponentially so that we have doubled the, uh, I think almost doubled the amount of exports that we do in terms of the products out of New Iron to the to new core. Uh, our, and our food and beverage sector has picked up as well. We'll the figures will bear us out, but I'm thinking it's around 18%. They've, we've picked that up. Our paper products have also gone up. So I'm told the tissue paper, our um, aromatic bitters has increased as well. So that whilst we have gone down in some food and beverage products in the um, in the region, where, which is our number two export market after the US, we've certainly picked up in other products, other markets. And this is really heartening. And um, so, uh, so we can look forward to, I think, not the kind of substantial drop that one would have expected on account of COVID and on account of all of the supply chain disruptions. I want to say that our manufacturers have worked very well in sourcing their, their, their imports from other, their, their inputs, sorry, from other markets and so on. So, there are lots of problems, but a lot of work done by all of the all, all of the partners in in, in um and, and the partners go across the board to the importers, the manufacturers, the agriculturists, the um the um the port and every facet. I think everybody has done well and have gone beyond to ensure okay. that we can supply and that our exports are improving. You are saying then that uh, let me understand you clearly. In spite of COVID. And in spite of the loss of markets in CARICOM, we have increased exports in uh, some vital products 
iron, yes. food and beverages, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and we have new markets. Could you indicate what are some of these new markets we are penetrating now? Right. So that, um, for instance, Panama is one of them. Uh, you would have really known that the Panama Partial Scope Agreement you would have signed on to your, uh, the government of which you were a part. And when we came in, we ratified, I think. And anyway, we, we continue to do work with Panama. I have met with the minister in the course of this year, and we continue to move some of our products into Panama. We continue to be Colombia as well. So uh, some, some of our products have gone into there. Into the UK, some of our specialized products are um our aromatic bitters etc going into some of the Euro european markets and um and there are other south american markets for instance our mattresses are going in and a number of our products are going through price smart as well the connection is there um price smart unicoma and uh, so that our mattresses have gone in now into uh, many of the central american countries so that also our tissue paper because of their connection with guatemala and some of the other um uh, uh, in some of the other countries in the Central American region, we have gone into those markets as well with those particular products. So we also that's have new market products going into the U.S. That's, that's very good. If you're getting new markets and you're also linking some of the products to international companies here, so that you can get them into other places as well. That's wonderful. And I'll tell you, I'm actually that despite COVID, again, we were able to do virtual trade, um, virtual, uh, uh, what you may call it, or virtual events in terms of getting um, getting our buyers into into those markets as well. So we would have had at least four and going into the and in 2021 and go already and going into 2022, we have another five planned. So we've gone back into Jamaica, to Guyana, to Colombia. We, um, we have, I think we've had one with Chile going into another um, with um, with um, UK, the U uh, US as well. So that Miami, so that we are continuing with all of our, our, our trade platforms and trying to uh, get by interest into all of these markets and despite COVID, but using our virtual uh, tools to continue to have these missions. All right, I'm going to ask you a, a question that you must expect, Minister, that I would ask, which is that, I mean, a lot of the business community has been complaining for years of the ease of business um, issues uh, that have not been attended to, and we are very low down. We are at 105. Um, we also have a situation in which the international record indicates that we have a net outflow rather than inflow of investment. Our competitiveness is not that good. I won't go into the numbers and our innovation is not good. All of these things are critical for the competitiveness of Trinidad and Tobago. I don't want to dwell on what the condition is. I want to really ask you, uh, what are you doing in your ministry to the extent that you can in order to address some of these issues? The ease of business, doing business issues, uh, the investment flows into Trinidad and Tobago out of the energy sector, greater competitiveness, more innovation. Right. And of course, you would know more, more recently, only yesterday, you would have seen the release where this ease of doing business is no more. And there had been issues at the World Bank in terms of this doing business report. And there would have been irregularities and um, trust issues with the doing business report. And um, so that the last that would have been done would have been in 2019, which would have been in the 2020 ease of doing business. And, um, and then, of course, there were investigations all of last year. So we had no ease of doing business ranking. And the report came out yesterday where there is, in fact, now it, the, the whole thing has been squashed. Um, because I said of trust issues, irregularities at the level of public officers in, and, and in the World Bank. So that's quite interesting. But nevertheless, we accept that there are deficiencies and that we, we will therefore continue in all of our efforts to improve what is now dubbed and what the population has come to understand as the ease of doing business. So anything that they're not getting there, uh, not, we're not able to do efficiently, is now all bagged under, under this. But that's, so we continue with, with our efforts. And I'm telling you that there's an all of government approach to solving a lot of these issues are electronic, digital, digitalization and so on. And there's an all of government approach 
to doing so uh, to, the, to the extent where we now have a separate ministry before we had one with the public administration and digitalization um, and responsibilities in one. Now we have a minister whose responsibility for digitization and digitalization and therefore it's an all of government approach so at every level at the ag's office you can find a lot of electronic services available certainly through the ministry of trade and industry through the SCWX, so the single electronic window which we started in 2020 2009 we're continuing we have another program on now and we're doing despite the first 46 e-government services we're doing a lot more as i said earlier e-payments you now can pay for your services for export tt4 um ttbs your standards as well electronically but it has to go across the board and in every service and therefore it's an across the board initiative but i was speaking to you earlier about the particular concern with the trading across borders and the number of inline the um, number of initiatives there in terms of online payments what we've committed to do is to ensure that for every, for all of the 46 e services that there are and we got cabinet approval that we will move to do we will move to, move to do online payments for every, each and every one of those services where applicable and further so that we are involved in that exercise now we had done um, an exercise a business process and re-engineering exercise and that was we got some international people to come down here and that would have been across the end of 2019 into 2020 and out of that exercise we've come up with 60 they've come up with 61 recommendations we've gone in and decided we will do 45 we further did a deep dive and took out nine that we are doing now so that there's a lot of attention being placed but these are not over you would not see the overnight results but i can tell you that in every ministry some have been ahead more than the others. We are ahead, the AG is ahead, and so on. But we are doing what we have to to ensure. I've talked about the support community system that we're doing to ensure that there's interoperability with the NAVI system, um, with the ASECUTA system, with the TT BizLink. That, I mean, that is. That alone, the procurement alone of that is something like a, a year or so because we have to follow IDP and CTB procurements um, um, guidelines. So therefore, and then of course, these processes are long. We've made headway in terms of the automation of the construction permits, which we work together with Ministry of Planning and Development through the SCW. And we've made tremendous headway. We're in Port of Spain. If you live in Port of Spain and you're applying for a permit to do a construction permit, you have to do it electronically. And that service has gone to Chagonas and San Fernando now, and Tiga Martin, and uh, I'm not sure to the Eastern End way. But we're moving throughout the country. So that. There's a lot going on, but many of these kinds of initiatives take a while. They're not as easy as you think. And we, it involves public, cons, I'm sorry, foreign consultants and procurement and so on. And this has been the bugbear, but I could give, through this medium, I could give the public the assurance that the work is being done at every level and at the direction of the prime minister. Uh, and uh, I mean, he's heavily involved and pushing us. To, to commit to this agenda across the, across all ministries. Well, I know from the Prime Minister's conversation here that he sees digitalization as critical to this process. And you yourself mentioned a whole of government approach. Um, and I, I want to say that for all of us, COVID has kind of created a condition of urgency and it has also accelerated the movement from human transactions to online transactions, etc. But it seems to me that we've reached a point where the whole of government approach must not look at digitalization as an approach and as a method, although it is central, it is key. But how do you get smart, responsive government? How do you get smart businesses, smart institutions? How do you get the interconnectivity and interoperability that you talk about connected in such a way that we can really move to another plane of business engagement? And I mean, do you see this thing happening in the next year or two years? I mean, how much longer do we, I mean, the whole world is rapidly moving forward. Can we do this yeah. quickly? Can we do this we quickly? We are. 
We yeah. are, but as I said to you, the processes, and I'm speaking from the government point of view because your question implied, your question was pointed to the businesses as well. Right. But from the government point of, uh, of view, I think we've done, we, we, the, the infrastructure, uh, the drive is there, and I could commit that we are doing the work, but the processes, the, and then it, it's, it's not an overnight fix, but you, will, you are beginning to see the results as you've seen with the automated um, construction process and so on. As I said to you, we are, the engagement is there. At the level of the businesses, you see this smart business you're talking about is absolutely imperative because if we are to improve manufacturing per se, and I take that as I'm most familiar with that, or even agro-processing or so, we have to think smart in terms of smart business, in terms of technology, in terms of, in terms of innovation, because the only way that we are small population, so supply in Trinidad and Tobago is a OK, but it does nothing to improve our revenues. So if we have to really think expansion of business and increase of revenues and so on, we have to think of other markets and exports. And if we're thinking of exports, you have to think competitiveness. And that's why if you're thinking competitiveness, the smart, when you say smart, it, inclu it includes quality, competitiveness, but it includes um, um, probably AI to some extent, uh, technology infusion. And on, on that note, in terms of the business, I mean, and, and I'll come back to innovation and entrepreneurs, how the, the fact that they must innovate. But when I come, when I talk about uh, of businesses or manufacturers and so on, and the question of whether they are smart and ready for technology, I am happy to see but my disappointment would be that it's at the level of big business and the bigger businesses in Trinidad. But I can tell you that, for instance, I visited, I think this week, in Nayaf, and there's full automation. And there are machine, there's machinery and equipment lined up to be introduced. And so that they've made some heavy investments. And so that, uh, where, where, let's say you're going to do a printed product, a large um, book, although you'll tell me that probably books are no longer ne necessary, but they're going to do a large book. And you see that you put paper in the end and at the end of it all, you get a book. <laughs> and that tells you because there's a full automation process. Last week when I also went to, um, to um, oh God, it's the Halutz place. Anyway, they do tissue paper as well. They're another one of our tissue converters in addition to, um, um, to, um, to God, I'm not thinking, but anyway, um, John Dickinson, they are a tissue converter as well, and gone to them, and I was so very pleased. Again, they are another investor, and, um, and during, even during COVID, they had made a substantial investment, fully automated, where you take the huge big rules at, at, at one end, and at a long end, quite some, some distance away, there is your finished product, I mean, embossed, um, uh, embossed, packaged, delivered, and fully delivered at the end of, of it. So the human intervention is really to, for quality. And I don't know to the extent of AI, some quality is done, some, some, um, some quality checks are done, but at the end of it, you have your finished product. And I have seen the robotics at Nestle, I've seen it at TYE, where we can be competitive to the extent where we are exporting um, circuit boards. When is, and, government, um, when is government going to catch up to that? Well, government is catching up. All right. The government is catching up. Okay. Okay. Blue water. Well, government and businesses, I'm seeing that the dovetailing is there and the intervention is there. But I'll tell you where it has to happen. It has to happen at the lower levels and the small businesses so that any small business that is getting involved, um, any small manufacturer getting additional equipment and so on, which is quite uh, an issue for them because the problem is always where do I find the money? Access to finance is their biggest issue. They have to think technology from the start. So if you're doing... I'll, I'll give you an example. For instance, I, when I went to John Dickinson, I also so they have delved into diversified into yogurt, and um, and that came out of a kitchen, and kit, out of a kitchen. Fortunately for them, they are able to um, to to invest, able to invest. But you should have seen the extent of their technology to ensure to, to, as as they as they commercialize and they move from the kitchen to the space where they are now um, in, in all of your large supermarkets, Price Mart, Massey, and so on. So right. you, 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 you mentioned small and medium businesses. A lot yeah, of yeah. those have been hit very badly by COVID. Many of them have, uh, well, it's, it's, some of them have collapsed. And they need help. Um, what help are you going to give these small and medium businesses if they want to find a way of surviving? 
Uh, do you have anything in place? I know some of the issues that you have, and each one of them has a set of problems. But is there a commitment from the government to help small and medium enterprises to get back on their feet? But you keep coming back to commitment, and the government's commitment is there. It's evidence from, and it, and it is from top down. I mean, I'm telling you, as the prime minister who is committed, and, and he is the one who would have commissioned this um, roadmap to recovery, recovery team, which came up with all of the um, all, all, all of um, all of the various ways forward for all of the things that are necessary to keep to keep business to, to keep business going and to improve on business to make sure no one is left behind technology etc so there is a commitment i want I, 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 there's no question i don't want you to question that though but you come you, you you mentioned the word collapse of business and i don't want you to paint a broad brush there no i said some, it, some some yeah because it's some but and, and i acknowledge the, the difficulties with businesses the world over what we are concerned about are the small particularly the micro the small and the medium-sized ones because the larger ones would have their what ability we, what are we doing to help them we what we what we have done already in uh, and what continues to be in place for instance there has been access to finance to keep their businesses going through the credit unions Certainly through the, um, the net for the smaller businesses, with um, where we have, where um, um, businesses can apply to Netco for grant funding, that has been in place for more than a year now. At the level of the um, SMEs, again through the banks, there's another facility that has been in place to the extent of three hundred million dollars, for which there was not substantial uptake uptick that um, um, Minister of, uh, of Minister of Finance has gone back in and revised that 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 program this is a guarantee program and uh, the loan guarantee program we have put in place that program now which is more extensive which would provide not only for liquidity support extends now to buying machinery and equipment at very low interest rates with a moratorium in place and with an extended repayment program in, in place it's completely revised and has been put out there and the details would be in the budget and this is available to all four of the major banks, in addition to which there are a number of grant fund facilities at the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Trade and Industry that people can, 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 can apply for. And I want you to make, allow me the chance to make this point. A lot of this is available, the loan guarantee facility to the banks. There's the grant fund facilities through the other ministries and so on. And a, a big reason, a huge reason why businesses have not taken on to these is because they are not compliant with regard to taxes. So That's you not are a required. Rocket science issue. It's not a rocket science, but the fact that it's, it's, many businesses you know. have created too many businesses are not registered and are not registered for, 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 to pay taxes do not have their employees registered in terms of NIS as well, are not VAT registered, and they have to become part of the formal system so that they can not only undertake and, and uh, uh, their obligations, but also their, their tax obligations, but also so that they can benefit from all of the facilities that are available, uh, available to them, for instance, through the loan grant facilities and the other grant fund facilities um, that are available to them so that they must move into the formal system as it is in all of the larger countries and, uh, and so on. You must move into the formal system and do the right thing and be prepared for conducting your business affairs in the right way, paying your taxes, ensuring that you support your, your, your employees in terms of their, um, their, their um, NIS contributions and doing your part. And then you can benefit from all of what government has available, and we and we do have a myriad of of not only funding of um, um, interventions, but also um, incentives. Do you know what the numbers are for, let's say, access to credit union loans? How many people, how many businesses have done that? How many? Um... Very few businesses have. Have, uh, have gone into the credit union system and it tells me that perhaps the credit union system does not have a, a, a large enough business population and something I would want to work with them actually so that they can become 
um, uh, a formidable institution uh, with, with financing available for small businesses, particularly at, at this level of the micro and the small businesses. So that's a, how, how that's a relationship people, that has to be developed. Have many people access those from the small no. business development? No. And you see, that's the no. problem with, with the 300 million also, we haven't had a lot of access because one, the terms and conditions were very onerous. I take your point, and the Minister of Finance has made this, of people not being compliant. I find that ridiculous. But instead of making a fuss about it, bring them in and get that done. And then the other thing, though, is that the, the revised loan, uh, the revised loan arrangements, which I think is better, and I think it's a good policy, in terms of a hundred percent guarantee, two years moratorium, Absolutely. those are very constructive things. But those loans are not yet available. You can't get one in the bank. The banks are not ready to disburse those loans. So what I'm asking you is that we have the budget on October the fourth. Can we uh, either on the way to the budget or immediately after the budget? get these things going so accessibility and in fact um, access actual access to the loans and the opportunities that the money has the government has made provision for can be accessed by small business because we are going to have a lot of businesses that cannot get back but, on their feet yeah, but as i said Bo, we have, and this is the Minister of Finance in consultation with the Bankers Association. I might myself have been involved to some extent very early. I have given him some of the recommendations in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. But those, we have agreed to the revised proposal. Yes, so I know that. Cabinet yes. has agreed. Sorry? No, no, I know that. I know that. Cabinet has agreed to it. The funding is available. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you exactly. But I know that the funding, $300 million, was made available to the bank. So I don't yeah, know that. It, it cannot, it it's a, if, if it is not, I can give you the assurance that the Minister of Finance would ensure that this may be. It cannot be disbursed. I have a specific um, example so of somebody who went for a $13 million dollar loan. They weren't ready. Applications would have been made to banks already. And now that we have relaxed the system, that those persons merely have to go into their banks to revisit their application process because those many of them would have already been made so that they can revisit and, uh, and in fact, take up these um, within, um, so within, a, within a short space of time. Okay, Minister. I can tell you with regard to the grant funding available at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, it is available. Funding is available. My disappointment has been the inability of um, of, 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 the, of the level of, the, of businesses in terms of the level of compliance, the willingness to at least do management accounts, the discipline. I agree to with at you. Least do I accounts. agree with you on those things, but we should not um, create the situation where we have money allocated. And the money no, 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 is no, 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 we have money. Finance has done its interventions. No, we have, and we have money allocated. We have money accessible, but we do not have instances in large amounts I don't of know. access. I don't know that that, that, that can be substantiated it both, can respectfully, be. It, respectfully, but I'm telling you that there are many um, it's applications which have been made, and that those persons with the revised uh, with the revised program can um, can go back into their banks. If there's any, if there are any gaps at all, I can tell you, our Minister of Finance will attend to it, and maybe he. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not in that ministry, but I give you the assurance that he's ex very, very committed to ensuring that these funds are made and available. So, if even if they're not, I'm sure that they will be soon, pretty soon. Minister, I, I understand how hard it is to be a minister, okay? But what I want to say to you is that this is something for the sake of our country, for the sake of business, for the sake of, of jobs and income that we need to manage. And all I'm asking you is if between now and the budget or after the budget, that can receive priority attention because it is so important, just like we needed to put food on the table for people who lost their jobs and were hungry. 
we also need to Dr. make Tewari, sure. Dr. Tewari? Yes. Yeah, that, look, we are so committed. All and right. I can give you the assurance that the Ministry of Finance Minister is totally bought in and committed to ensuring no, a, that these um, fund, that, funds are made available. That's why I'm asking you, which is that okay, There's an open the minister, door There's no, the Minister of Finance committed. wants to do that fine. But the Minister of Trade, and who has all of these, not just manufacturing and services, but all these small businesses under her SMEs, use your good office. Because, you know, the people in the business community always say good things about you. So you've got to act Thank on you. their behalf to facilitate the process. Okay, Minister? We are not talking fighting to the choir. We are trying to solve a national problem. We are not fighting no, at all. We're trying to solve a national problem. What? Yeah. Sorry, I missed, I missed what you said last. And now, now I say, you should require. You don't have a problem. I can tell you the Minister of Finance is fully, 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 fully committed. So let's wait for the budget. Apart from the budget, um, things are happening all the time. All right. Okay, we'll see. I'll, I'll, we have to close up now, Minister. And I must thank you for agreeing mm -hmm. to come on the program and for... Thank you. Um, talking, I think, forthrightly on the issue. I mean, you tried to, to explain some of the issues and you articulated clearly. I'm glad for one positive thing, which is the, if it is true that we are expanding exports to some of the new markets, I think those are very good. Uh, if automation and uh, technology transfer is taking place at the, in the manufacturing sector, that is very good. Um, but I think the whole of government approach to create that smart economy and smart uh, government, I think that is critical and it cannot be avoided now. And in fact, COVID is the best platform to make sure this happens. So I want to wish you Absolutely. well. I want to wish the government well in its budget. Uh, I hope they will choose the right priorities. And I hope one of those priorities would be to help small and medium enterprises in Trinidad and Tobago. Absolutely. And I want to thank you, Dr. Tawari, for inviting me and um, getting an opportunity to speak to the nation. Okay, then. And thanks again. Thank you. All the best. You've been listening and watching the Honorable Minister of Trade and Industry of Trinidad and Tobago, Mrs. Paula gopi Schoon, And we had a conversation about trade and industry issues uh, the COVID impact, uh, investment, uh, exports, etc., all of which are critical as we approach the budget. So we will see what the budget brings. I want to thank you for listening and watching. This is Brighter Morning with Bo on MCTV and U97.5 FM radio, multicultural radio. Hot Like Pepper Radio Multicultural TV. Uh, hope you have a nice day today. And my name is Botiwari. We hand over to Chanel Al-Suran and the news. Mm -hmm.